So uh, hello everybody and I'm happy to uh, host uh, Yoav Levine that will talk about uh, analyzing the self attention architecture and improving the must uh, LM objective. So Yoav, thank you. Thanks a lot. I'm very happy to speak here and live, even more exciting. Um, I'll, I'll be, I mean, I'll be focusing on work done uh, with our group uh, here at the Hebrew University. I'm my advisor, working closely with my uh, fellow students, Or Noam, Fofit, and Daniel. And I'll be uh, mentioning or, or expanding briefly uh, on uh, some works done with the uh, guys at AI21. I'm known Shai and Amri from our department, but other other guys from uh, from other places. Um, now, as a setup for for this for this whole talk. I'm talking about this, uh, most of you, all of you probably know that NLP has experienced its image net moment, the moment where an art, a paper comes out and the distance for, between the current state of the art and human performance is, is shortened dramatically. That's what BERT did. So we call it the BERT moment in NLP. And, you know, just as a historical anecdote, so it came out uh, in October 2018, just two months later, uh, you went to the leaderboard of a, a prominent question answering benchmark in NLP, and you had to go all the way down to ninth place in order to find a non bird based architecture. So that's the immediate and dramatic impact that this, uh, this work uh, had. And the subsequent year has seen just uh, hundreds and thousands of follow ups and bird variants, multilingual bird sentence bird, and so on. So this is about the, the impact uh, the work had. And I'm gonna be talking about two uh, main success drivers, pillars, uh, which caused this, uh, this success. The first one is the architecture, which has actually been around uh, about a year earlier. Uh, this paper, Attention is All You Need, introduced the only self-attention only architecture, the deep self-attention architecture. We'll be dissecting it in this talk. We'll be really uh, getting into it. Uh, the second success driver of word undoubtedly is its bidirectionality. So uh, language models, neural language models tended to be unidirectional or uh, autoregressive um, largely up until BERT. And BERT is, is, the, is a very simple method, but powerful to create inherently bidirectional representations of text uh, and learning these representations from massive amounts of unlabeled data. So that's, that's the B in BERT is bidirectional and it's, uh, it's bidirectional objectively we brought it forward. So just to, to touch upon it and Towards the end, I'll be focusing on the architecture. Towards the end, I'll be talking about the objective a little bit, but it's just to mask a word in a sentence and try to predict it. So that's that's a self-supervised scheme that's very straightforward, uh, but turned out to be a big deal. Um, so yeah, so in this talk, uh, because it's a theory seminar, I'll be focusing uh, on analyzing the expressivity of the self-attention architecture. Um, and I'll get to at least one one of the two uh, more empirical papers. Uh, one of them presented this week at, at iClear. Um, we just had a, an oral session in the middle of the night a few nights ago. It was terrible. So I hope the Zoom thing fades out slowly. Um, so let's let's dive into the premise of the, of the first paper. Um, and it starts with the general notion of depth efficiency, which we're all probably very familiar and comfortable with. Uh, this golden age of deep learning, deeper is better. W better than what? So if I have a fixed parameter budget, it, there's, it's, it's widely you know, perceived by now that it's better to, to just have more layers that have slightly less parameters per layer than actually spill in more parameters into, into less layers. So deeper and narrower is better than shallow and wide. That, that, that notion has widely been uh, validated empirically in continents these, this past decade. Um, and also a theoretical line of theoretical works on various modifications of neural networks have shown this theoretically depth efficiency with, with proofs and so on. Um, and indeed in cognates, uh, when, when optimization issues were solved and cognates were able to train in hundreds layers and more, then performance increased and resonance have broken the state of the art in these years and so on. Now, our story begins with, with just uh, surveying the landscape of the prominent self-attention models and noticing that this doesn't seem to happen there. So when looking at Bird Large, the first model we talked about, it had 24 layers, it had 300 million parameters. It's quite a lot, but it's grown a lot since. Um, and today the, the prominent networks are uh, representative of them is, T, is Google's T5, it has 48 layers and increased by a factor of 100. 
And GPT-3 has 96 layers and increased almost by a factor of 1,000 to 0 0.2 trillion parameters. And it's evident by looking at this table that they increased the size dramatically, but not, not by a deepening. They mostly lied. The parameters were invested uh, within the layers, and the, the deepening was by factors of two to four. So ju just this phenomenological observation was then followed up by, a, uh, by an, an empirical ablation of this aspect by OpenAI, where the x-axis here is the network size, the y-axis is the test loss, so lower is better. And they showed that the overall performance of a network largely depends only on the number of parameters and not on the depth to its allocation. So if we notice the yellow curve, um, it's networks above six layers, they note in their legend. And by private correspondence, I had to find out that the networks there were 12, 24, 36, 48, and, uh, and 207. They trained the 207 deep networks along this curve, one of the largest ones on the right. And it, it does appear to, to follow the same improvement trend. So this, this, this has been regarded as some sort of a, something else is happening in self-attention. This uh, notion of depth efficiency doesn't seem to hold, and there's a big question of why. So uh, a first part of, of my talk would be our, our theoretical treatment of this aspect uh, of self-attention exclusivity. And what we, what we come up with, and we're going to go over it slowly and we're going to derive it, um, is that self-attention exhibits actually does exhibit depth, depth sufficiency, classical and even strong depth sufficiency, but it does so only until a certain point. So if you add layers, it's, it's, it's good, it's very good, it, it really increases the power of the network until a certain point in which it doesn't really matter if you widen or deepen. And that point is logarithmic in the width, in the dimension of the, of the representation. So we're given, the, the, the formulas are gonna be explicit, but this is the, the high level flashing of the result. Um, so we do establish a depth inefficiency regime of self-attention, which I'm not aware of in Cosmetics. And this, in our view, seems to, to explain maybe uh, what, what we see in experiments. And we're, we're gonna dive into it, okay? Now, this is the, uh, the theoretical, uh, let's say, result and, and approach and question. I do want to spend a minute and convince you guys that this is not just a fascinating theoretical question, but it really bears significance on the field's progress in, in, in several, in, in the architecture related regard. I don't think it can progress in other regards, but the, the architecture, this is really a fundamental question because GPT has trained a 0 0.2 trillion parameter model. As of last week, they're not the only one. A Chinese model of the same size or slightly bigger has been also trained. And there's generally a race towards 1 trillion parameter models. Uh, why? Because GPT really has amazing capabilities relative to uh, smaller networks. And there is a, a big uh, a volume of our field thinks that just by increasing the architecture, you're going to get magic. And they haven't been dis disputed so far. So this is a, a really practical question. And how these companies or, or efforts would go about is, first of all, you have hardware considerations in, this, in these scales. Uh, and when you ask yourself how to increase there's hunch and there's smart people with smart hunches, so they operate based on that. You can also use the fact that GPT not only trained the largest, uh, their largest model, but also models up until then, sort of uh, surveying the, the landscape. And you can say, well, if I have a budget for a 1 billion parameter model, if it's a strong model, it can solve many tasks, whether in the academia or in the inter industry, then OpenAI probably did ablation, so I'll train the 24 layer networks like they did. Okay, so that's generally how people answer these questions. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's worth noting that in a, the more veteran um, class of continents, maybe more successful, that's debatable, but um, more veteran for sure, only recently works like EfficientNet have attempted to answer this exact question in a more principled manner. They found heuristics uh, based on experiments uh, for, for how to increase depth and width in tandem such that the architecture is, is is strong, you like find the sweet spot, they, they got a rule, which is important. And they showed that if you have a 60 million parameter budget, they broke the state of the art at the time with a fraction of the parameter. So no, but noticing this, how to increase, turned out to be important in confidence just recently, a few years back. And in some attention, th there are no such guidelines. So we set out in pretty uh, ambitious, but then we got uh, a budget from Google for training for free TPUs. So we trained hundreds of networks, literally, and we were, we uh, made this plot, which I'm also going to get into. So we're going to have a second experimental section, which 
I want to present thoroughly uh, how we made this, let's say, Israeli plot, which says the following, uh, this table says the following. This is what open AI trained in practice, but this is what they should have trained for their parameter budget. So your $10 million model here on the bottom, the 175, you probably wasted a few millions, okay? And it is, there is audacity there. So we're gonna, we're gonna show how we made our fit and how we made these claims. And the overall, and this is to, to wrap up the intro, the overall conclusion is that in terms of network expressivity and in terms of experiments and practice that corroborate uh, the results, uh, the road to one trillion, the, the, the sought after one trillion parameter mark should be done by a widening and massive widening, unprecedented widening. This width that we propose for one trillion parameters on the bottom, which they didn't train, but the next, the future step is 30K. The representation dimensions should be 30,000. It's larger than anything I know. Um, and, and, and progressing in an informed matter means maybe developing technologies for parallelization. As a remark, it's easier to parallelize width than depth. So maybe these are good, this is good news for people uh, when they ask this question. So I think it's a great time for questions here or at home, because we're gonna dive into the, uh, both the theory and the experiments one after the other. How did you introduce the uh, HK3 Which, no, no, this is, these are our experiments. We have, we've made a lot of experiments, so. Okay, uh, but, and this plot right now is uh, cryptic. We're gonna, understand it as we go. So let's take two things. So the first plot that you showed for all of the first one layer, two layers, six layers, they're all on the same on the same line, meaning that you gain nothing by that, right? This was like the first thing. But now you're claiming that you do gain and you gain significantly. So this right. Is like this is our I mean line. so how does this compare right. to this uh, uh, so so the the fact that we got so many PPUs actually allowed us to conduct experiment at this scale and more. I think that the overall price of our graph is, is, is by, by a factor larger than this graph. And we, what we did is we addressed this as a serious question. I mean, this is part of a, um, a lot of different ablations they made. And I'm not, there's no criticism, there's just more, more insight that to be gained by dividing this over six, this yellow curve into different depths. So we're gonna get into that. It's a great question. and. I'm gonna argue that, first of all, you do see some sort of depth efficiency in their graph from one to six, wherever they allow me to look at how many layers are trained here, then I do see something, and we're gonna quantify it and, and, and have it in a, like a, an extensive empirical setup so that I'm, I'm sure of, of, of what we're saying. And, but yeah, okay, so th these are the experiments, and I'm gonna start with the, uh, with the theoretical, like, yes. So how big is I thought so. Uh, so there's a question here regarding whether uh, it's only about the architecture or also related to the task uh, which we uh, measure this on. The, ta the task we measure this on uh, is autoregressive language modeling, uh, which is a challenging task. It's, this is a task that's you don't you don't uh, overfit on it. Okay, you don't get to zero loss in this test, and that's why we we took it as a proxy for network. Ex for network expressivity, but also there are optimization and generalization at play in the experiments. So that's why, and we only analyze the expressivity. Uh, that's one thing to note. And regarding the problem itself, so um, we did we did get them on a specific language modeling problem, and we I will be alluding to other. I mean, self attention is infiltrating other domains, vision, and so on. And we have some recent results submitted to this ICML. Um, which I'll, I'll describe. Okay. So, okay. So let's get into it. But, but uh, I think some of some of the uh, questions. Let's get into it. Well, there's going to be a slide with your question. Yes. So the width is the representation dimension. And I'm here. Okay. So attention, self attention. What, what are we at? A lot of you probably know this. Um, here, the notation n is the number of inputs to the layer. Dx is the width, and the inputs live in Rdx. So the width is the representation dimension. And obviously, the number of parameters per layer is correlated. It's actually uh, quadratic in this number. Um, so the self-attention operation, I, I, I wanted to start with a, a, just a, a simplified variant just to see how simple the operation is, and then we'll add the multi-heads here. So what it does, uh, essentially it's a sequence to sequence uh, function and uh, each output, the output at a specific uh, uh, position i 
computes a weighted average of the inputs. That's what it does. Uh, and the, the weights, the AIJ, the attention weights, are not like a fully connected network because the first line up here is just like a fully connected network. We look like just learning weights uh, between I and J. And the, 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 the Gleek and attention is uh, uh, having these weights depend on the inputs to the layers themselves and how you sort of uh, project the uh, input at the location of the output, that's XI, via a query matrix into a DA dimensional space. It's called the attention dimension. And you project all the inputs to this space via the key matrix WK, and then just take the inner product, turn that into a distribution. And so that's the very simple operation of a single layer. Um, and the complication in the multi is, is is also not very complicated. What you essentially do is you just take H uh, such sets of, of, of operations and you sum them up in a, in a weighted manner. So this, this WO is just a weighting uh, H outcomes of, of the previous slide. Um, that's essentially it. I mean, I hope that it's, it's, it's clear to everyone. And what a BERT a transformer block looks like is this, this layer that, that's written up here above followed by, with a residual connection, followed by a feedforward network that has a nonlinearity um, in it. So that's a transformer block. And so just so we're clear what we're, anal what, what, what we're running and what we're analyzing, this is a, this is a, a depth L self-attention network uh, that's run in practice. Now we're gonna spend a, a few minutes talking about the relaxations in our theoretical analysis. Gonna I'm gonna briefly justify uh, both the relaxations that we make. Um, and then the, the next thing would be that the experiments are conducted on the, the actual architecture and not on the simplified architecture. So that, that will be another, another reinforced, reinforcing uh, aspect. But, but touching upon what we're analyzing. Okay, so the previous thing was actually BERT. The first thing we do is that we omit the normalization from the tension weight. So instead of having a softmax over the outcome of the inner product, we, we just don't, okay? That's the, the first thing we call this unnormalized self-attention. The second normalization, the second relaxation is that we discard the nonlinearities between the layers. So we have in this inter, interleaved uh, uh, operation with birth, self-attention, feed forward, and so on. We just discard the feed forward layers. And starting with, with this relaxation, uh, the discarding of the, of the rally operations, I'm actually uh, there's a pretty compelling argument for why it leaves us with an interesting network. And the argument was, uh, is based on results by Press et al, which analyzed such reorderings of the transformer sublayers. And one of their variants is called the self-attention first uh, BERT or, or self variant, in which they first perform the self-attention layers and only then perform all of the feed forward relative feed at the end, okay? And what they show is that on a, a language modeling test called Wikitext, they reach a perplexity, well, Birch reached with a perplexity of 18.6 with a standard deviation. Self-attention first performs slightly worse, but within that standard deviation, when we're comparing the best pre-attention architecture just the same year before Bird came out, the best LSTM uh, result, we get something that's dramatically worse. The perplexity lowers better, and this gap is big. This tells you what a lead Bird made, but it also tells you that this self-attention first, uh, first variant performs practically as good as BERT. And why it's relevant to our case is that um, you, you have to notice that once the self-attention layers are finished, the, the, the spatial locations don't see each other anymore. This feed forward operation is powerful, but it only operates per location. So any input mixing that took place in this right variant really happened within the self-attention layers, which as we saw, are, are great at mixing and puts together. That's what the function computes. But in contrast, the feed forward net, uh, layers do not do that. So you had to have probably these nonlinearities for performance in order to extract information that was there in the contextualization. But, but, uh, but in terms of uh, the operation of interest, which is the contextualized representation of the input, uh, this, is, this takes place in self-attention. So that's why our, our variant uh, is interesting in this regard. And in terms of the normal, any questions on this? Or, okay, we can take questions after the relaxations. So in terms of the normalization uh, relaxation, so here in the beginning, there was, a, there, was a lot of, there was an intuitive explanation that attention, really we have an attention budget and we're sort of distributing where to look at, what inputs to look at and, and as a fractions of your overall attention budget. 
Um, but a line of work is sort of said that attention doesn't really do that. And it's not like if you look at the attention, you see what the network uh, uh, computed and, and this weighting doesn't really have this, this explanation, but rather, and, and there's there are other works that sort of uh, also challenge the softmax itself and says that it, the specific softmax normalization gives some constraints and also train networks without any normalization to show, show that they actually train. Um, and this is not to argue that BERT should be without softmax or without rally, but rather that the cooperation of just mixing the inputs or having the, the weights of this fully connected network depend on the inputs in this manner, the connectivity is, is the core mechanism that drives the, the functionality of mixing the inputs together. And this is what we're analyzing. So, so going forward, we can be said, said to be analyzing this here on the right, uh, concatenation of unnormalized self-attention. We're going to give results on what this operation does. We're going to ask the relevance. Yes. It's not linear. In the, uh, yeah. The output is like the square the polynomial. So the degree of the polynomial is exponential in the depth. This is part so of per layer. It's one square. Per layer. Per layer. So this is one one self-attention layer. So it's actually uh, cube. Because right, yeah, there are three axes here. Like uh, isn't it three? Like because there are three axes. Oh, so you gotta you can, because i is the output index, but you do take so so this this is the function. This is, and it's 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 cubed in the input, each layer. And and schematically, what we're analyzing, I could write like a sum over n terms of interaction between the output location i and each and every j that we sum over. And schematically. Following the same scheme, when, when we analyze this concatenation of self-attention layers, it can be written uh, as the, the interaction term, firstly, now is an interaction between i, the location at the, of the output, and an exponentially large subset of the inputs. That's what happens when we concatenate these layers. We have this c being 3 to the power of l. Um, and now each interaction term, schematic interaction term, is between i and, and uh, 3 to the power of l inputs. So that this is how. The receptive field of the, uh, the the complexity of the operation grows with depth. This is this is the uh, just the, the, the sketch of the dependence. We're gonna uh, do it more exact later. Um, and why three to the power of L? Because when you look at a single layer, uh, you can see that X is introduced three times. And if I reinsert the output of a layer to the subsequent layer, it's gonna the output is gonna appear now three times. So I'm gonna have three to the power of two original inputs. So we have uh, an exponential amount of, in, with depth, amount of inputs that are taken into account here, but also the number of summons, which was, not, which was linear in, in the input, is now exponential in L. So, exp so it's n to the power of C different summons because we have C indices now. So this is just, just looking at this, apparently there's an exponential contribution to some sort of a vague complexity notion that goes around in this function that's computed, okay? So at this point, we have to be perplexed because on the one hand, we see that attention uh, in, in ablations does not benefit much from depth. On the other, deep learning depth is good. Also, we know theoretical results on various classes of architectures that show depth efficiency. And when we look at the operation of self-attention itself, it doesn't seem, I mean, it seems to enjoy depth as well. So why, 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 why this thing? And before, before giving our answer, now, now would be a good time to note that a possible explanation is, yes, if you analyze the expressivity, it's going to be exponential, you're double exponential. So you're getting the right thing from your expressivity, but in terms of optimization, the left hand side here is actual experiments. So maybe the data itself doesn't even need this expressivity. There are many, there are many possible explanations for that. What we'll argue is that you can find it within the network, the, the core power of the self-attention mechanism in terms of expressivity, you can find this behavior. If you look closely at it, so it's it's not about the data. It may be also about the data optimization, but it's also about the expressivity itself. Okay. Now, before answering, um, I'm going to define what could have could be in this. It could it could almost be regarded as a technical detail in the proof, but it does give some insight regarding what self attention does. So I think it's it's worth worthwhile. So I'm, I'm introducing the notion of a function's separation rank. For a scalar function, it's defined with respect to a uh, partition of its input. So a partition is take uh, half of the input, call it A. The complementary part of the input, you call it B. And the separation rank of a function with respect to a partition of its input is the number of summons that the function can be written as a sum of 
where each sum n is multiplicatively separable with respect to this partition. So let's take to understand the function with separation rank one. Uh, separation rank one means that we can write the function uh, as just a product of two functions, one operating over the inputs in A and one operating over the inputs in B. Separation rank two means that we can't write the function like that, but we can write it like a, a sum of two such things. Okay, so that's uh, this is what what it means, and 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 in a statistical setup, the separation rank one is a, is a hard constraint on the hypothesis present. It means that you really can't model dependency between uh, subsets in A and subsets in B. And the higher the separation rank, the more correlation we say uh, the, the the network induces between uh, its subsets. And prior results on this measure have shown that convolutional and recurrent networks from our group, we've shown that, uh, let's say, continents are really inclined towards one partition. They really have high separation rank, the model functions that have high separation ranks with respect to a third partition and lower separation rank with respect to another partition. That's a trait of continents, specifically the partition which they're really good at is this interleaved partition. And this is their inductive bias towards local correlations means that, that they can model functions that are really strong with respect to neighboring, neighboring uh, inputs being correlated and weaker functions with respect to further away uh, uh, pixels being correlated. Okay, so, so this is existing architectures. And I'll also note that we tied, just as a side remark, this is a digression. If someone here is interested, we tied the separation rank to quantum physics measures of correlation between quantum particles. So we tied the separation rank to mm -hmm. quantum entanglement. Um, and gave results on how convents and RNNs can model uh, quantum entangled systems. But getting back to self-attention, which can also be invoking thought of what to say about self-attention that works with uh, modeling physical systems, but also modeling language, we give this different result. The different result in self-attention means it's quite intuitive, but, but still different from convents and should be stated that the separation rank in, in self-attention is invariant to the partition. You, the network models the same function a priori before learning the weights. It has the same potential with respect to any partition. And one can argue that this flexibility in modeling input dependencies may have allowed self-attention to be better at language. This is the first great success of self-attention, which and, and where, where it's better than continents, because it doesn't language doesn't have the same inductive bias like images, where really you have to model the neighboring uh, pixels. Uh, well, and, and you can have more erratic correlations in language. Think about if I say I'm not doing something and then I detail what I'm doing in language, I need to remember that not, even if I'm pretty far away, in order to understand the sentence. So this is, in language, there's a, just a, this is an illustration, but there are more erratic correlations. So maybe the fact that self-attention does not model weaker functions with respect to further away inputs is, is, a, is an advantage of self-attention. But it's not enough to be agnostic to the partition. You also need to be pretty strong. And what we'll do is we'll quantify how this separation rank uh, increases when you increase the depth and the width, and we'll use that. We'll use that to to obtain our results. Okay. So the first result is a classical uh, depth efficiency result. What we say is that in this regime, which is which is the important thing here, because there are two regimes, but in the regime in which the depth is smaller than a log of the width. And we, when we assign the actual width uh, values, we get dx of 1,000. So L is around 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, something like that, log, log of the dimension. Um, then, uh, then we bound the separation rank of self-attention of a depth L width dx uh, network uh, between two functions that grow double exponentially with depth and polynomially with width. Okay, and this is a classical depth efficiency result because this allows us to say that a, a shallower network cannot replicate the operation of a deeper network if it doesn't grow double exponentially because the width contribution to separation rank is double logarithmic relative to depth and two functions can't be equal <clears throat> if they don't have the same separation rank because in order to even be able to replicate uh, the function, you need, to, you need to have its separation rank, so it means you need to, to really grow double exponentially. So, so here, here's a depth efficiency result. The interesting thing is that in the converse regime, the complementary regime, where L is, is a maybe more practical depths, larger than some log, um, we get, a, 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 I think I'll skip the details, we get a dramatically different result where the separation rank grows exponentially both with depth and with width. So they're on equal grounds, okay? 
And, um, and, this, and this, first of all, gives for the corollary of the fact that you can't establish depth efficiency by, a, by this technique. Um, but, 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 and also sort of, I think, if, if the results as they're written are understood, um, I think this gives formal grounds to, or, or a, a formal relation to what happens in the depth inefficiency uh, manifestation that, that has been shown in, by OpenAI, the fact that it doesn't really matter if it's deeper or wider, you essentially get the same result because depth and width are in our bounds are on, on equal grounds. And this, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean that depth and width are the same. So it invalidates this general notion that it doesn't matter in self-attention whether you deepen or widen. So it's important, this subtlety is important. Um, yeah, uh, and, and, it, and it pinpoints the fact that the network widths really control when it's gonna be depth efficient or not. So we also have the, the, uh, the factor which controls it. And uh, the intuition here behind why we got this result is that it actually grew very fast. It was a double exponential growth. And it got to the point where it saturated the dimensions ability to facilitate this, this growth. Okay, so at this point, we're gonna uh, wrap the, the, the part of the theoretical result before we move on to experiments. So it's a good point for questions. The inefficiency with respect to the separation rate. I mean, it doesn't rule out the possibility that you know the efficiency with respect to uh, other measures. That's right. Exactly, and that's 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 right. So the depth efficiency result was was sealed in the sense that it, you can't replicate. You have to have the same separation. The depth inefficiency result simply states that this measure of separation rank, which has Roots and other places and so on, but it, it, you you can't you you can't say that one is better than the other, which is in stark contrast to what happened just just on the other side of this regime transition. So something happened there, uh, but it doesn't rule out that if you measure other other measures of complexity. And I think it's 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 uh, it's a valid point to state, which we will elaborate on in our paper. And we say that the fact that uh, you know the the intuition behind the separation, the fact that it does. Uh, Correspond to some ability to model correlation. And the fact that uh, self attention's you know claim to fame is the ability to have this uh, this contextualized representation correlation between the inputs really puts this measure as something to look at. And I think that the next section of maybe, uh, of looking at uh, of results and what what is actually needed to solve language modeling also reinforces it. But there's no seal depth inefficiency from all the, from all uh, from all angles resulting. That's right. I mean, it's still consistent that, that there's uh, uh, an exponential growth in the efficiency in terms of uh, you know, function classes, right? There, it might be that there is a function uh, that you can express with a conformer of depth L, and you cannot do this unless with a conformer of uh, It might be, yeah. I'm not sure. Sure. I'm not sure that it has to be. Yeah, right? no, okay. but, but you right. don't rule out this. Don't rule out, exactly. <clears throat> okay, so. Any, if there are no other questions, we're gonna move on to the experimental setup. Okay. Um, okay, so the first thing to know in the experimental setup is that it was done not on this relaxed version of self-attention, but rather on regular common, as they call it here, self-attention networks. Um, it, it was extensive, even more than 150, hundreds of training networks, uh, depths ranging from six and 48, and, and scaling almost three orders of magnitude with the largest network, is, it's pretty big, it's larger than bird based not GPT-3 scale, uh, but the experiments have covered and we needed that some scale, some orders of magnitude in order to get the trends. Uh, we trained unidirectional models. It's important because first of all, experimentally, we saw it's a, it's a stable set of things. So we took maybe I think between 10 and 15, maybe 12 of our, of our experiments. We re-ran them five times just to get the standard deviation of, of our process of getting the test result. And we saw that in the unidirectional case, the loss was stable up to the second or third digit even uh, of the number. And when running bird, the bidirectional case, it was much more noisy by a factor of 10 maybe. And this has to do with maybe works I'll, I'll touch upon in the end about the objective, why the bidirectional objective is, is noisy. But to our, to our uh, point now, these are unidirectional models. And I'll, I'll spend a minute on just getting acquainted with the graphs because they really tell a lot. So again, the x-axis is the size and the y-axis, the network size, the y-axis is its performance, lower is better. And each of the, uh, each of the plots has two networks, uh, a shallower one and a deeper one. And each of the colors uh, corresponds to a specific depth. So what we do along the blue line, for example, here on the left, 
I don't know if you guys see the colors like the home. So this line is the blue line. We each each little dot is a full train network, a million steps, Wikipedia, and so on. So it's full pre-training. Um, and uh, we, so, we sort of varied the network width only because the depth is kept constant and we increase the network size by just increasing the width from point to point, from little point to point. And what we see, let's keep on focusing on the left one, is that six and 12, until a certain point, perform on par. 12 is not better than six up until a certain network size. And from that size and, and onwards, 12 is better than six. So there's a, a clear depth advantage um, here, so that's why we call it, and, and we mark the, the, the border between the gray and white areas by where it becomes statistically significant better when the deeper network is statistically uh, significantly better than the shallow one. And this takes place um, in, in all of our comparisons. And interestingly, the location of the transition increases with the depth. Okay, so that's the next thing we're going to follow up on. But first of all, to, to, to just to see that we're in line with why our theory really coheres with, with these experiments. First of all, by predicting the existence of these two regimes, but also where they would occur is also in, in commensurate with our theory because what happens in the, uh, in the gray area is that the deeper network is not wide enough so that it could uh, be efficient with respect to its excess layers. So both networks are 12 and six, for example. The 12 layer networks here on the gray regime is pretty narrow in order to have this small size. The 12 layer network was pretty narrow. And this width didn't cross the threshold so that it's wide enough so that 12 can actually utilize all its 12 layers and become depth efficient with respect to all its layers, okay? And at this point, six starts underperforming because 12 is wide enough such that it could actually be better. So that's why it's in commensurate with our theory, but I do wanna say this explicitly. So, um, okay, the next thing we did is we sort of conducted a meta experiment where we charted where this transition between regimes occurs as a function of, of the depth, okay? Because we saw that it happens more to the right and we wanted to quantify this. So I'm gonna focus on the left-hand side point at the bottom, this, how we established that the six layer, the six layers networks uh, uh, is here. So what we did is we took, we took six and 12 we sort of had a coarse grain experiment uh, uh, around the transition. And we said, where's the last point where 12 is not better than six? Where's the first point where six is statistically significantly worse off than 12 layers? And we're gonna call this the depth efficiency transition width of six layers. From this width on, deepening may be better than, than white, okay? And we, we treated this, you know, we needed errors here because we're gonna extrapolate and so on. So we took the error of our estimation as just the half of this, uh, this, this regime of uncertainty. Um, and that's how we charted these five points. And why did we have a linear plot here? Because we took the log of the width as a function of depth, really because we said that this transition should occur when L is logarithmic in the depth. So this, this uh, uh, corresponds to this. And um, we, we made this fit. We had not a lot of points because it's a meta experiment. So it was important for us to see, you know, goodness of fit measures. It's an okay fit. I think the chi-square, to those of you who are familiar, is a little low because this implies an overestimation of errors. But I mean, if it's not very crucial to anyone here, we might uh, be better off skipping it. And what we did with this linear fit is that we translated the width at the transition as a function of depth into the network size that transition as a function of depth by simply saying that the network size is equal to 12 times the depth times the width squared. And now we inserted the width dependence on depth that we achieved from, from the plot here. So it's 12 times the depth times, this is the width uh, as a function of depth squared. And we got and propagated the errors. And now, now the interpretation of this, this plot is that architectures to the top left of the curve we've established that they're too shallow. This is, they're underperforming. So for example, if I have a budget of a hundred million parameters like bird base, and I'm training a 12 layer network like bird base, I'm, I'm too shallow. I, I could benefit by deepening. If I deepen, I'll, I'll perform better, okay? So bird base is in fact suboptimal in its architecture because it could be improved by deepening. Okay, so that's one of the, the type of arguments we can make by, by charting this dependence, but in our experiments, we saw an even more interesting phenomenon that didn't come from theory, but we saw it definitely, 
the sharp eyed uh, observer could have also could have already told me here, it's not only the deeper is better on the left hand side curve, but it seems like the deeper is worse off in smaller network regimes. You check out this 48 layer network. It's actually, it, it becomes statistically significantly better here on the bottom right, but it's, it's actually worse off than 24. So noticing this, we, we sort of, this, this, this uh, graph schematically shows this phenomenon where each, each parameter regime has an optimal depth. It's not only you can improve by deepening. Sometimes you can improve by widening, which is not something that corresponds to a theoretical prediction, but we did notice it. And this would imply that if the uh, bottom, uh, the top left here is too shallow because of, of how we constructed it, then the bottom right somewhere there is, is too deep, okay? And it's not the, it, it really, it's not the minimal depth for being, uh, the, for being good. It's an optimal depth. You can be also too deep, okay? So taking all of these, and I'm, I'm working towards our, uh, you know, our audacious claim versus the uh, GPT-3's uh, experiments. So what we did is, these are our five data points here on the bottom left, but we extended our fit with propagation of errors um, to, to larger, to, to, to network sizes that we didn't train. So we didn't train from a billion and above. We didn't train, but we could, extrapolate the same function where this transition would occur. And, and because we didn't take experiments there, the error obviously grows as we go farther from where we took the experiments. But it's important to note that um, uh, all the way up to 1 trillion parameters, that's 10 to the power of 12 parameters, the relative error is 20%. This means that if we're recommending to have the trillion parameter uh, uh, model uh, 100 layers deep, it's either a trillion or one or 1.2 trillion or 0 0.8 trillion. That's that's the that is, that's why it's still relevant and 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 also surprising at the outcome that it needs to be only a hundred layers deep because the 0 0.2 trillion parameter models is virtually there. It's 96 layers. So so it's uh, okay. So that's how we essentially uh, we got we got to our uh, to our curve versus the actual train. Now the, these these are these purple points are what they actually train. And generally, we can see that up to 10 billion, all models but their largest one could have been improved by deepening. Um, but the converse conclusion, because of this logarithmic dependence, uh, is true for how to really scale up. Then you can, you should focus on uh, widening. Okay. So because of the multi-million dollar price tag of this race, I think uh, optimizing this has meaning, as I said, and it's a good. Time to take questions and ask you how much more time do I have. That's how I'll choose what to. Okay. So, uh, any questions about this as well? Okay. I think. No. No. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that this separation rank approach will not will not say it. But I mean, I I have not not theoretical, but the hunch why it may be too deep because when when the, the representation is too small. If you have a very deep network spread over a presentation that's too small, so maybe you, it, it can't hold. Uh, I'm not going to say it's not going to be exact. But you can think intuitively why this may, may be the case. Mm -hmm. Oh, Shaal, yes, why in the, on the very left hand side, then it could be too deep. You know, it can improve by widening. So, yes. So, I don't have good good answer for that question. just note that um, when you add layers, we're talking about a fixed parameter budget. So when you add layers, you got it's not, you can't do the identity. I mean, you can also make uh, no, you can't because the, the layers are narrow. So that it's not the 
you're losing on this. So it's not a trivial trade off, but it's, it's worth thinking. But I will move forward because we have uh, some stuff to cover. I think now is the time to just give a teaser before we move on to the objective because our current uh, ICML submission uh, got good reviews and it's a, I think it's a fascinating work led by Yong from our group. Um, what, what he did is he noticed that uh, something that doesn't really happen in language is really prevalent in other domains. Uh, in vision, which is an important domain, which transformers are trying to get into. Um, and that is the, the initial input representation. If you think about an RGB representation, it's an R3, for example. If it's too small, you're going to get a, a bottleneck in expressivity. And really, it's a cap on the width's contribution to expressivity. So the effective width of a network in, in our uh, new result is really can be given by the input dimension, which means that if the width cannot, if by increasing the width literally doesn't help you because you're capped at the input, you should increase the depth. And this is really us giving explanations to, to, to vision transformer, for example, uh, vision transformers that are, are deeper by, by an order of magnitude than language transformers. And we're, we're arguing that the reason that they have very deep models is because they're not enjoying width. And that's because their internal, their initial dimension of the input is too small. And we, we show how having a convolutional layer at the input sort of uh, increases the dimension and allows vision transformers to enjoy the same depth width considerations as in language, which are the optimal for them. So this is really a teaser. And I think because of the time left, I'll skip, I'll skip a, a more linguistic result. Um, and I'll get to, uh, to a work, a recent work on the objective. Um, that's, that's actually presented in, in this ICLR this week. Um, so so let, let's uh, let's get out of the architecture uh, mindset and remember that what Bird did is also uh, make a novel objective. Its objective was to mask a word and try to predict that word. And there are some great things to learn because if you see an expression like "Don't let the fox guard the hen house," and you occlude fox here, so maybe now you know about the relation between foxes and hens. And so, so, so it's, it's much better than just having this uh, earlier objective where don't let the fox. Okay, so I learned something about the language statistics, but right now I'm not learning about this relation of fox in, in the context. And I'll just note that the bidirection could be very, a, a very interesting task, but it could also be a more mundane task. Because you can, if you're randomizing the masking, which you are, you can also just hide unimportant stuff like don't let the, okay, so obviously the was going to be there because it's English and it's syntax. It's a much shallower signal, okay? So our, our work um, tells us this, this masking strategy, this new degree of freedom that was introduced by Bert really matters. Um, and this, the blue line here is, is the regular random token masking of Bert. This, is, this uh, plot is what happens along pre-training, the x-axis is while we train, while we pre-train for a million steps. How does the performance on question answering benchmark uh, go? And we, we, and prior, there, there are improvements to Bert's vanilla random masking strategy. One of them is called uh, random span masking here in red, which is really the prominent masking uh, uh, approach taken by all the big models, hopefully until they see our paper. Um, and what they did is that they didn't mask random tokens, but they masked random spans of tokens. So, they sort of randomized uh, contiguous span and that improved performance. And our paper, which uh, this approach that I'll now detail, uh, masks spans, but informatively. So I'll tell you how this, this uh, speed up and improvement comes about. Okay, so as a motivating example to understand why random token masking is bad, um, uh, uh, I'll note that Bert sees raw text as tokens in a vocabulary. So what it does, it gives a token per word, and, and, and words like president get a token in Bert's vocabulary, but rarer words like gerrymandering are not frequent enough to make it into the, the vocabulary. It's, there's a limited size, so they're uh, decomposed into a sequence of tokens, and this double number sign says a part of word token. So in the regular Bert 30 vocabulary, most words do get, uh, do get a, a token, and only rare words uh, get, uh, get tokenized, but what we did is superficially reduce the vocabulary just to have a situation in where many words in the input are tokenized. So we reduced the vocabulary to 2K and now almost every other word was tokenized because you only had 200, 2,000 words that could, could have gotten a token, okay? And the reason we did this was to show that this, the x-axis here, we control the amount of tokens per word by reducing the vocabulary. 
So on the right here is the 2K vocabulary, which, which uh, has two, almost two tokens per word. And we showed that the performance of the model that you train in this fashion really drops. And the reason it drops, as we can see here on the, on the bottom, an example, um, is that the task is very easy. You see Jerry Mastering. Okay, so it's probably, I, I've seen this once or twice. So I just memorized the word gerrymandering. So I know how to complete this specific token just by its immediate context and not by broader context. And similarly, vice masculine. Okay, so the model doesn't need to understand language. It just needs to memorize the word president in order to complete this. Okay, now a known fix to Bert's flaw in subword tokens is whole word masking. Okay, whole word masking means that if I randomize one token, I'm going to take all of its words. So if I randomize Jerry mastering, I'm gonna mess everything together. So I can't just learn intro, intro word completions. And that really helps performance. We see the training bird by this simple rule uh, really attenuates the degradation that we see even in such vocabularies. Now this whole drill was just to show that correlated neighbors harm performance because the model can latch onto uh, local cues, but masking and occluding these local cues helps. What we did in our paper, we extended this understanding to neighboring tokens, which are not part of words, but the neighboring words that are part of expressions and phrases and entities and so on, such as they're called collocations in language, the editor in chief, carbon footprint, English is full of these, and, and, and you can't, you can't uh, enlarge your vocabulary such that it includes them. So it's a real problem that can't be solved by, by, uh, by a simple heuristic. And what we did is propose a simple heuristic to solve it. We segmented the sentences uh, to, uh, to, to local, to, to, to shallow cues. So this, this running example, gerrymandering is named after former vice president. Each of, each of these is considered highly indicative of one another. So if we mask one, we mask all of them, okay? And I think in lieu of time, I'm gonna, how much time do I have? Um, Okay, so so yeah, the, the main the main idea here is to quantify the the mutual information between tokens. So uh, you know, pointwise mutual information is is to ask how surprising a bigram is uh, given given the unigram probability. So what does this mean? We have probabilities of each word in the corpus. The book is a prevalent word. Is is a prevalent word, and the bigram book is is a prevalent bigram. So it has high frequency in the corpus, but it has a low PMI range because because both words are frequent and we divide here the frequency of each word, it means they're not especially indicative of one another. When I see is, it's not sure that book is gonna precede it. But a rarer uh, term like Boolean algebra, if I see Boolean, probably the next word is, it, it has a hot, algebra really jumps over its regular corpus statistics. Okay, so based on PMI, we extended PMI to longer n-grams because language doesn't have only bigrams. And I think I'll, I'll skip this part. And uh, we're showing you that uh, compared to the baseline of BERT and compared to the best, uh, the best practice uh, so far of random, random spam masking, this more informed matter um, um, of, of implementing BERT's bidirectional objective by noticing where it can really uh, decrease your performance uh, helps. And these are uh, leading language ben benchmarks which we improve. And when comparing to, to prominent models, I think uh, we could go over these, but I, I think that we achieved Roberta's uh, performance. And Roberta did the regular random token masking by a sixth of the training time. So really, to, to, to think about how you implement your objective with respect to the statistics of the input allowed us uh, in this uh, more empirical work to, uh, to, to dramatically uh, improve the efficiency of training, this pre-training of round language. Um, a comment to think about from this uh, paper, which, which raises a thought, is that the, the regular uh, objective of BERT was aimed to minimize this random token perplexity. So uh, if, you, if, you just, if I just measure, if I hide a token, how well can I, uh, can I predict it? BERT is great at that, okay? This is the regular BERT. And our PMI, PMI masking is pretty terrible at that. It's, has receives a much worse, worse score and also uh, random span masking receives a worse score. And uh, this, this token perplexity is perceived as an evaluation metric of, of models. And to see that it's so uh, uncorrelated to downstream performance, because our approach, if I only looked at this measure before measuring the downstream, I would think it's not a good approach. So you can't really compare 
only by looking at the perplexity. They've definitely been doing things like training differently than this. This is a, a token of caution. So just to, to wrap up, um, the success drivers were the architecture and the objective. Um, we dived into the architecture and, uh, and, and how noticing the uh, specifics of the depth and width can, can improve. Um, and and the, the, the overall message here in terms of the objective, we only touched upon one, but if you know things about the input, um, it's an important inductive bias, in, even in a self-supervised setting. Okay, so we kept, we kept, we kept the self-supervised setting and we were able still to train without any labels, but I noticed the input correlations and the work I didn't get into. I noticed some internal structure of the input helps helps improve uh, the training. Okay, so I'll wrap up and take questions. Any questions from home or, okay. So we had a yeah. So the, the the novelty, which I didn't have time to get into, was how how to uh, elicit engrams that are indicative of one another, where the basic PMI metric is defined for bigrams, and then we and then we needed to identify the trait that really would help with this shallow signal. So which engrams should be masked? Uh, was an issue that uh, we made some contribution. Can like which end are best. Can you try uh, understanding the model which word um, attended to each uh, last token and then try to learn which word was? Great follow up thought. It's a good, it's a good idea. It's a good idea. Played with it and gives good results. So thank you, Ilan. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. And, uh, see you all next week.